Welcome to Decision NYC with Ben Max. I'm Ben Max, your host and the executive editor of Gotham Gazette. The 2021 New York City election season is well underway and it's poised to be the most significant municipal election in decades. All of city government is on the ballot and because so few incumbents are eligible to run for their current seats due to term limits, New Yorkers are electing many new office holders and the next roster of leadership for our city. There will be a new mayor elected here in 2021, as well as a new city controller, several new borough presidents, and many new city council members. That's not all that's on the ballot. A number of incumbents are eligible for and seeking re-election, including the city's public advocate. And there's a very crowded and competitive race for Manhattan District Attorney, and still more. In this episode, we're focused on the race for Manhattan Borough President. Party primaries are set for June and the general election in the fall will culminate on November 2nd. This is the first full set of municipal elections with both early voting and the new ranked choice voting system, which applies only to party primaries and special elections. And we'll have a separate show on ranked choice voting. This city election cycle would be of enormous importance under more usual circumstances, but it's obviously unfolding at a time of great crisis for our city raising the stakes of the decisions that you, the voter, will make. The new wave of city leadership elected this year will quite clearly make or break the city's recovery from the devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic and its many impacts on health, families, jobs, education, housing, and much, much more. It's also important to note, of course, that New York City faced a number of crises well before COVID, and several of those have only gotten worse. So it's an important time of choosing here in New York City, and we're pleased to bring you a series of interviews with candidates for citywide and borough-wide offices, and there will be debates. These one-on-one -on -one conversations will help you to get to know the candidates better, learn about their backgrounds, their platforms, where they stand on some key issues, and their vision for the city and the office they're seeking. We hope this and other interviews will help you sort through your many choices and make an informed decision when it's time to vote. So today, as we focus on the position of Manhattan Borough President, it's a borough-wide office with several core responsibilities around land use, community boards, capital funding allocations, and more, but also a key role as a planner, an ombudsperson, a cheerleader, and a representative for the borough of Manhattan. The borough president appoints community board members and convenes community board leaders while also acting as a convener in other ways and issuing reports and making other appointments like to community education councils. And the borough president has a bully pulpit, which can be what that office holder makes of it. And the borough president has an especially important voice on land use matters. So that's an overview and we'll get into the details here in our interview today and with other candidates. But joining me now by Zoom is one of the candidates for Manhattan Borough President, City Council Member Mark Levine, a Democrat. Councilmember Levine, thanks for joining me. Ben, thank you so much. You know, I've been following your career since 2012 when you launched, I think it was called Decide NYC, if yes, I have that correct. correct. Very similar. Great to, yes. great to see you're coming full circle with Decision NYC mm -hmm. and, and just uh, happy to be part of the conversation. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, and, and likewise, of course, the years you've been in the council here, uh, we've been been covering you at Gotham Gazette and here on MNN and elsewhere. So now you're running for borough president. But before we get to that campaign, uh, tell voters and viewers just a little bit about your background and what brings you to this race. You know, I'd majored in physics in college and then became a bilingual math and science teacher at junior high school 149 in the South Bronx. Bilingüe, como usted bien lo sabe, hablo español bastante bien. I was a proud union member, very active in uh, my school's union consultation committee. And I went on to a career in community service, starting a nonprofit in Uptown Manhattan, a community development credit union. Actually, it's called Neighborhood Trusts. It's still going strong. It's made $25 million in small loans, micro loans, helping families uptown do everything from start their own small business to buy the first home computer. Repayment rate on those loans is 98%. So it's a real testament to the spirit of opportunity uptown. And that's the base that uh, allowed me to run for office, uh, 5,000 credit union members at the time I first ran. And I'm really proud now to have won election twice in the incredibly diverse seventh council district, one of the most diverse districts in the city. Uh, I represent now a little piece of the Upper West Side starting in 96th Street, uh, Morningside Heights, West Harlem, 
and Southern Washington Heights, where I live uh, with my family. Uh, my wife and I have two sons, both public school students, one high school, one CUNY. And uh, for the last seven years, it's been my privilege to represent this district in the council. I chaired the Parks Committee in my first term, where I fought relentlessly for equity in the park system, making sure we steered resources to underfunded parks. I'm proud to have passed right to council for tenants and housing court. I hope we'll have time to talk about that in this term. I'm chairing the health committee of the city council. And over the last year, I've just put my heart and soul into the fight against this pandemic, standing up for science and equity. And proud now to be a candidate for Manhattan Borough President. So a few things you mentioned I want to come back to, but let's just stick with that. Why is the role of borough president important in your mind if voters uh, who aren't as familiar with the ins and outs of city government as we might be come up to you and they say, all right, you're running for borough president. We like you, but why is this position important? Look, it's important at any time. I think the incredible Gail Brewer has proved that, proved just how powerful the office can be in the right hands. But now more than ever, we need a voice that will lead for the borough, that will put forth a bold agenda and organize to achieve it. And this office really does have important levers of influence, uh, over 1,000 appointments on community boards and many, many other bodies, uh, budget authority, the ability to uh, offer discretionary grants for capital and uh, the ability to introduce legislation as well. And of course, real influence over land use. And what it all adds up to, Ben, is a powerful platform for organizing. And uh, this is how I've led in the city council. Uh, I passed right to council for tenants and housing court as one of 51 members in the body, not because any one member has absolute power, but because I led a three-year organizing campaign, mobilizing allies uh, in labor, in faith-based groups, uh, amongst tenant, act tenant activists, using the media, and we won. We won after three years of tough work. And that's the kind of work I'll put in as borough president, again, to put forth a bold agenda and organize to enact it. All right, so, so give, us, give us a few highlights of that agenda. What's on the bold agenda? Well, first and foremost, uh, I'm gonna continue to lead on COVID uh, because unfortunately our fight against the pandemic will continue into 2022. Uh, and, and that means centering science-based policy in our response and centering equity in our response uh, and making sure that we come out of this crisis by once and for all addressing the deep inequality in our healthcare system uh, so that we ensure that every single person in this borough and the city has access to quality primary medical care in a way that many don't, hundreds of thousands citywide, particularly those who are undocumented or lack health insurance. And uh, I'm gonna make sure that uh, we address the underlying inequality that has been revealed and exacerbated by this pandemic beyond healthcare, whether it's in housing or employment or economic circumstances. We cannot go back to the status quo prior to COVID. And so that means going really big on affordable housing. It means going really big on economic opportunity, uh, centering small business and the recovery. Small business has just been brutalized by this pandemic. We need to come out of this in a way that puts them first and takes unprecedented steps to save and strengthen mom and pop stores. What would um, be one of those steps? What would be a big step to help save mom and pop small businesses that would be on the Levine agenda either, either this year while you still have legislative power, of course, in the city council, or if you become borough president, something you wanna lead a campaign around, as you said, to, to try to get past. What's one, one big pillar of a small business rescue well, plan? First, just let me say how outrageous it is that we have not provided financial assistance directly to the small businesses that we have directed to close because of safety concerns in this pandemic. It's, it's just outrageous. Um, and uh, we, we, we must do more to steer direct financial assistance for rent relief and other needs to small businesses. Uh, first and foremost, that should come from the federal government, but the city and state can and should do more on that front as well. Uh, beyond that, we need to get free legal assistance for the smallest mom, pop, mom and pop stores that could be engaged in tough fights with better resource landlords. I'm proud to have passed legislation um, in August of 2020 that expands the city's offerings of that kind of assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, we need a review of fines and fees to make sure that first and foremost, it's about safety and health, not about generating revenue for the city. Um, and we need to make sure that as businesses can start to grow again, can invest, can expand, that they have access 
to capital, access to loans in a way that many don't because the mainstream financial system is failing them. And that's why I am working on legislation to create a public bank in New York City owned by the people of the city through our city government that would take as much as a billion dollars out of the Wall Street banks where we now have it on deposit. This is the city's money and put it into investments in NWBE, small businesses, worker cooperatives, uh, affordable housing, community land trusts, green technology. We want to supercharge investment in the sectors that will help bring about a just recovery. Um, we're working on legislation now, and I will continue this fight as borough president. That call for a, a public bank in New York City seems to be growing momentum. I hear discussion of it in the mayoral race, which, which always helps move things along in the agenda. But obviously, if there's things really uh, happening at the city council level, there's, there's still uh, a little under a year of governing in this, in this roster to, to go. So that's interesting. Hasn't the sort of dynamics of, of rent and commercial space been flipped a little bit on its head by COVID? It's not the same playing field it was, right? I mean, right now, landlords have a lot less leverage than they used to, don't they? I mean, aren't there things about the COVID crisis that have really necessitated thinking differently about how to um, incentivize a strong small business sector? Look, running a business was incredibly difficult in New York City prior to COVID. And the last 11 months have really confronted small business with an existential crisis. And uh, you clearly see this on rent. Rents were too high to be sustainable prior to COVID because of all the changes in our economy, such as the rise of online shopping. But in these circumstances, they're, they're just absolutely unsupportable. And uh, rents have to come down. There's no way around it. Leases are gonna have to be adjusted to create low, lower rents for existing tenants. And um, there are some good policies on the table to help make sure that happen. One, which is uh, led by my colleague here in Manhattan, Keith Powers, would offer tax incentives to landlords if they adjust commercial rents uh, to lower the, the, the amount they're charging. Um, I am actually confident that when that happens, if that happens, and we need to fight to make sure it does, that there will be a, a whole new generation of entrepreneurs ready to stream in with innovative new ideas for business, because this does remain an incredibly entrepreneurial town with mm -hmm. people who are innovative and determined. Um, but to make that possible, rents much must come down. That's the key. And I think government has to make sure that happens. On the land use powers of the Office of Manhattan Borough President, what kind of philosophy do you bring to that? You mentioned the need for more affordable housing in the borough as, as key to your campaign and your vision. Uh, how do you accomplish that? Do you think Manhattanites need to uh, really be ready for welcoming in you know, more uh, development in certain parts of the, of the borough? Uh, what's your overall sort of vision and philosophy there? Look, in order to move into recovery for the borough and the city in a way that uh, prioritizes the, the emergency that we face in lack of affordable housing, that prioritizes good jobs for workers, we're going to need big vision on land use. And we're going to have to review the entire borough from top to bottom, every neighborhood, to look for opportunities to create the kind of housing that we need that, that, is, that is affordable to the people of this borough. Uh, whether they are at the lowest levels of income, people who may even be one step out of homelessness, but also people who um, may make sixty or eighty thousand dollars a year. Maybe they have a job for the city. Uh, maybe they're driving a bus, uh, working as uh, an EMT tech. Uh, it's hard for them to afford housing in the city too. So we really need uh, tiers of affordability. Um, the truth is that we've been neglecting those at the lowest end of economic ladder and. Um, needs to be prioritized. And, and that means reviewing every neighborhood to look for opportunities, particularly next to mass transit, where there is uh, good infrastructure and, and the ability to create new housing uh, for people who, who need it. And, and, and Ben, that can't only occur as it has too often in recent decades in low-income neighborhoods in black and brown communities. Uh, I really want a, a, a full borough review, a comprehensive review, so that uh, we have equal sharing of, of the benefits and burdens of development in a way that we really haven't until now. As you sit here now before doing that comprehensive study, which parts of the borough do you think are 
potentially on the menu for significant mixed income housing development. There's obviously a lot of support going around in the city for this uh, rezoning of Soho, NoHo to open it up for more housing development there. Manhattan overall is obviously a borough where a lot of times um, it's possible to leverage the market to create affordable housing. Um, but where else besides Soho do you think that could happen? Well, look, Soho, absolutely, there is an opportunity to um, add some density, particularly on the edges of the neighborhood where you have some undeveloped sites or single story sites and, and, and create uh, potentially hundreds of units of desperately needed affordable housing in a neighborhood that's seen very little. Obviously, we have to respect the integrity of the historic district, um, but I think there's an opportunity for a real win-win there uh, that will help um, uh, bring much needed affordable housing to the neighborhood. Uh, there is a site at the World Trade Center complex, Five World Trade, which has a proposal right now on, on, on publicly owned land that I think is inadequate in what it does for affordable housing. Uh, I believe it only would capture about 20 to 25% of the units in a very large, very tall building for affordability. Uh, that could be a 100% affordable site. Uh, again, that's publicly owned land in a neighborhood that has far too little affordable housing. But Ben, I, I have to point to what we're doing and fighting for in my district in Morningside Heights, which is a neighborhood that hasn't been rezoned since 1961. This is really the classic problem with land use in Manhattan, in the city, where we've just had a patchwork approach and it's left many neighborhoods uh, in a really bad position because they haven't had zoning updated. And so what you have in, in Morningside Heights is uh, really wildly out of scale luxury towers that give zero units of affordable housing. Um, and so we're pushing forward a plan that's really balanced that uh, centered the voices of the community through a great community coalition in partnership with the community board that would, yes, add density to the avenues so that we can capture some affordable housing uh, it would also have some height limits, especially mid-block, so we get no more of these 35-story towers mid-block in a low-lying neighborhood. Um, there's a site next to uh, the one train on 125th Street where we think we can particularly add density in a way that would capture a, a lot of affordable units. So this is a, an example of my vision, which uh, centers the need for affordable housing so that we can begin to, to, to grow and recover, but also... Um, puts the voices of the community front and center um, in a really important way. And I'm proud of, of this plan. And um, if we don't pull off passage while I'm in the council, if I'm lucky enough to be borough president, uh, I'm gonna continue that fight until we do right by Morningside Heights. Over the last several years, there've been neighborhood rezonings in East Harlem, in Inwood. Um, are those generally the right approach, obviously, in any specific example, different things could be tweaked, both in process and in outcome. But broadly speaking, um, you know, is that the type of approach you think should be taken to other swaths of the borough? Look, there, there, are, there are things that I might have done differently uh, in some of those rezonings. My, my biggest takeaway is that it's just profoundly unfair that the only neighborhoods that we are upzoning are predominantly African-American and Latino. That's just been a pattern for decades, unfortunately accelerated over the past seven years. And that's really just profoundly unfair. Uh, and uh, it, we, we, we have to change that trend by uh, looking comprehensively citywide and borough-wide and finding opportunities to update zoning in a way that could create desperately needed affordable housing especially when it's near transit and has good infrastructure and, and, and not taking a pass on neighborhoods that happen to be wealthier. Uh, that's the kind of vision that, that I'll advance as borough president. Do you support the idea of a, of a citywide comprehensive planning approach? Is that something you support? And when you talk about doing a top to bottom review of Manhattan, are you saying that you'll do that with an eye of putting out sort of a, a Manhattan plan? I do think we need a Manhattan plan that looks at uh, all resources and burdens, um, including housing, as I mentioned, but also parkland, um, streetscapes, uh, homeless shelters, uh, bus lane infrastructure. There's so much that is often distributed in an inequitable way throughout the borough that um, we could do in a more fair way if instead of going piecemeal neighborhood by neighborhood, we had a plan borough-wide. 
the the, the um, comprehensive planning package that you're referring to at the city council level is a really big proposal that would include many different legislative actions uh, requiring city council legislation, uh, state action, uh, amendments to the charter. And uh, uh, so it's, it's actually uh, far beyond what you could do as, as a borough president. Um, but much of what they're seeking to accomplish with uh, this citywide proposal is just simplifying what is a far too complicated process already that really doesn't serve anybody. Uh, for that, you do need things like charter changes. Uh, and, and those are the kinds of changes that, that I would certainly welcome. Not ready to, to weigh in on every component of the plan, but uh, there's much of it that I certainly do like. Community board appointments, uh, community boards, making sure that community boards are representative of their communities, making sure that you, you know, don't allow uh, just some of the loudest voices to dominate the conversation, uh, that you balance sort of uh, longtime neighborhood residents with, uh, you know, newcomers. How do you approach, uh, if borough president, appointments to community boards to make sure they're representative and working with community boards to advance uh, change that you think is needed? I just believe so much in the, in the importance of community boards. Uh, I was proud to serve for five years on community board 12. I chaired the traffic and transportation committee for uh, about two and a half years. And uh, uh, I wanna do everything I can to elevate the voices of these critical uh, forms of hyper-local government. They have to have diversity, which reflects our communities, our borough. And uh, I'm really pledged to, to do everything I can to make sure that happens. I'm proud of my record in appointing members to community board seven, nine, and 12 over the last seven years, uh, which 65% of my appointments have been people of color. Uh, but diversity needs to be measured on a lot of different fronts. Uh, diversity of perspective. We need to make sure we have more residents of NYCHA on community boards, more people with disabilities, more uh, owners of small businesses, more union members, more young people. Remember high school students can serve on boards and we need more young voices on these boards. Um, we need more uh, New Yorkers of trans experience than we currently have on community boards. And uh, I also think that we need uh, diversity of, 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 of preferred uh, mode of transit. Let me explain what I mean by that. There's a long list of questions on community board applications about all, all aspects of, of housing type, uh, renter versus homeowner, et cetera, occupation. Uh, I wanna add a question to the community board application about uh, whether people own a car and their primary means of transit, because I do think that people who primarily get around on mass transit um, are underrepresented currently on many community boards, and that's something I want to fix. Do you think um, there needs to be significant changes to parking in Manhattan? Fewer on-street parking spots. I know you've talked about a, a, a permit system. Go ahead. Well, for, first of all, I think we have an opportunity coming out of the pandemic to re-envision street space and um, to center people. Uh, it's why I support outdoor dining and why I believe it should continue. It adds life and vibrancy to our streets. Um, but to, to center safety uh, of people who are on foot, who are using a wheelchair or other mobility assistance device, uh, for people who are riding bicycles, who, who too often have been exposed to very dangerous conditions and are dying and getting injured in, in unacceptably high numbers on our streets. And there's a whole host of really great policy ideas that can solve problems by creative street use one of my favorites is solving the problems of mountains of trash bags that accumulate in front of um, our buildings in the city by creating uh, uh, attractive containers on the street, which can hold garbage and recycling in a way that are rat proof, that's very important, and, uh, and more visually pleasing. Um, but as for parking, Ben, uh, I'm a big supporter of creation of a program of residential parking permits in Manhattan and citywide. Uh, almost every other city in America, at least big cities have such programs. We have a big problem of countless thousands of commuters coming in from outside the city every day, dumping their cars on residential streets in Manhattan because they don't wanna pay for parking. That's really unfair 
And um, I think through a program of residential parking permits, we could stop that kind of practice and uh, bring a little more order and fairness to the streets. Uh, so we have, I have legislation on this in the city council, which I'm fighting for now, and I'll continue to fight for as borough president. We unfortunately just have a few more minutes, so I'm hoping to get to a few things. Maybe the last couple will have to be just uh, sort of yes or no answers. Okay. But I do want to ask, um, the, the COVID crisis where you've been central as health committee chair, we've seen this sort of repeated pattern where the de Blasio administration is laid on things, flat-footed, making mistakes, not prepared, um, and we sort of see this cycle over and over again. Should the city council have not been more proactive throughout the last year, basically at the point you know we're at now in sort of um, pushing the agenda? It seems like we've been caught in this cycle repeatedly where the council sort of reacting to the mayor's mistakes, threatening legislation, having an oversight hearing, but thing nothing's really, you know, we're going through those same cycles over and over again. Well, I think the city council has been extremely active. I've personally been extremely active in fighting for good policy uh, based on science, based on equity, based on open and accurate communication to the public, all things that the city's failed on at times. And let, let's be clear that, that, that city council doesn't run government. Our job is to provide oversight and legislate and, and bring accountability. That's what I've done at health chair. And by standing up when I have um, seen mistakes at the level of city government, I have won big victories. Uh, I fought really hard to make sure we had a quick shutdown back in March. Uh, and I have fought again and again and again to deliver better policy in this pandemic throughout the crisis, uh, including through early warnings. You know, I wrote uh, an op-ed with uh, Dr. Uche Blackstock in Gotham Gazette, Ben, mm -hmm. uh, back, back in December, uh, warning of the danger of inequality in the, um, in the vaccination plan. And, and what we what we warned against has happened, and and so I put bills in to fix it. Uh, I fought for 24-hour vaccination sites when we had a sluggish start to the program, and it, it happened. Uh, I have fought for a single unified website that would make it much easier to register for an appointment. And thanks to this advocacy, uh, the mayor is now moving in this direction. We need more work on that. I suppose it's on those things that you list that you know. Maybe and maybe this is just the fact that there's an executive branch and a legislative branch, and it's hard for the legislative branch to sort of execute in an emergency situation. But you know, those are the things that I'm referring to about whether the council could have more proactively, and this is not just you, but you as part of the council, you know, sort of more proactively insisted on a, a unified vaccine appointment site. Let's say you know ahead of time, as as we knew it was coming. But I, but I but I hear you on on where your voice uh, has been. Just last couple of things, and unfortunately, they have to be uh, sort of yes or no answers. I, this deserves a lot more time, but we talked about other important things. The jail plan uh, that's moving ahead, move it ahead in its current form, tweak it or scrap it. Look, Rikers must be closed. It's a humanitarian catastrophe. It must be closed, period. Uh, it is much more humane to have smaller community-based jails that are modern and have room for social services. The pandemic and the fiscal crisis certainly warrant a reevaluation of some of the details of that plan and something that I uh, am looking forward to engaging in in the months uh, and years ahead. Mark Levine is a Democratic candidate for Manhattan Borough President. Uh, thank, thank you for the time. Thank you, Ben. It's been a real pleasure. All right. And all thank you for watching Decision NYC with Ben Max. Key decisions for New York City voters are coming up in the June primaries and the fall general election. There's a lot on the line for all of us in the future of this city. I hope this conversation and others are helpful to you as you get ready to vote this year. I'm Ben Max. See you next time.